Um, my hope is that we can use it to fuel our discussion a little bit in class on Thursday, which is related to chapter 15, which is virulence factors. Um, so I think by doing this, it'll help you understand them a little bit more. So it's a little bit of a complicated topic, and I noticed that on the get to know a bacterium, some people kind of glazed over it. When I mentioned virulence factors, like they didn't really look up what that meant. Um, so virulence factors are uh, these genetic traits that bacteria have that let them cause disease, and they fall into uh, a set of categories based on what their function is. And so I happen to come across this database, which I took a screenshot of, um, that actually has a pretty comprehensive list of virulence factors for different bacteria. Um, so I'm, I was like, I should have double checked the link, but hopefully it's still working. Um, so I'm just gonna pull it up real quick. So this is like a nerd dream, because this is what I studied when I was in school was virulence of bacteria. Um, so when you pull up that hyperlink uh, that's in the, docu in the document, it comes up exactly like the screen. And then on the left side, you just pick an organism that you're interested in. So you can pick any of these, um, doesn't matter. And then you're gonna choose um, a couple of virulence factors and describe them. So let's say I click on salmonella. Um, and it gives me actually, so I think I also asked you to like describe the disease process, like what it does. And so it actually gives you a really nice summary. Now please don't copy and paste, like you wanna paraphrase from your own uh, understanding. And then um, if you scroll down to the bottom, those are the virulence factors. And so they're actually like in sort of in the categories that I'm gonna present them to you. So like um, adhesion factors, adherence for example, those are all proteins that they use to stick to a host cell. So when you click on it, it'll explain it. And if you don't understand it, that's fine. Like just try to summarize it the best you can. And so what I wanted you to do was pick two from two different uh, categories. So like I would prefer that you didn't choose like two that are in the same, that you pick like one from this category and one from another category. Okay, so that's what I meant by two different categories. And then I'll ask you guys to kind of explain it to me and then we'll discuss and try to put them into groups. Um, and because that's how you'll be tested on the virulence factors. It's not that you have to memorize all the ones that are in chapter 15. But if I describe one, you have to know which category it belongs to. So like if I say, this is a substance that you know disrupts cellular metabolism or something like that, you'd be like, oh, it's probably a toxin, right? Because that's like poisonous. So like you would have to try to fit it into a more general category. Okay, so hopefully that'll make more sense if you do this activity. So you pick an organism, you describe the disease that it causes, like the signs and symptoms, and then you pick two virulence factors from the database and you describe their function. Like how are they, what do they actually do? And if you don't understand it, that's fine. Um, we will discuss them uh, as a way of talking about chapter 15. So this is worth 10 points. So like try not to blow it off. Like I know it's work, but it actually won't take you that long because most of the answers are, all the answers are in one place. Okay, so you're gonna wanna bring that with you. Um, you don't have to, I guess, well, you probably should print it or handwrite it so you can turn it in so I can mark you off um, for extra credit. So that was what I emailed you and that's what I made the announcement on. Any questions on that? So it has a special due date, it's due Thursday. You can hold on to it for now, Brenna, like, so that we can talk about it next time. So, uh, what was that? Oh, you're not gonna be here? Okay, you can just turn it in then, that's fine. Yeah, and uh, if you have individual questions about it, um, just let me know. Yeah, thanks, I forgot about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, bring that with you on Thursday so that we can talk about it, okay? And then it's worth 10 points. All right, um, any questions? All right. Okay, so I think uh, I left off somewhere in here. I, I felt like my bookmark wasn't quite in the right spot. Um, so I think we talked about how like frequent diseases are. That's what I kind of remember which is the uh, incidence and prevalence. So I'm gonna start here, I guess. Like we might have, did we get past this a little bit? Yeah, that was Barely. the last one, right? This is the last one, right? Yeah. All right, I'm just gonna start here. Um, so if someone, I feel like uh, one of the ways that you can assess your personal risk for a disease is like by how common it is. 
some diseases are like really common and some aren't. So you kind of can then decide like how afraid of this should I be. Um, so one way that you can describe something as incidence, it's the number of cases that develop over a period of time. So incidence is good for things that are only gonna happen one time. Like your incidence of getting diagnosed with HIV, you only get diagnosed the one time. So incidence is the calculation that makes more sense. And then if you're talking about something that you kind of always expect to happen, uh, then prevalence might make more sense. And prevalent is saying like how, basically how common is something. And they're not denoting if it just developed or if it's been going on for a while. It's just like an average like snapshot, like right now, how prevalent is allergies? Or right now, how prevalent is asthma? The incidence doesn't matter as much. Incidence kind of matters more if you're trying to track something that you don't want more of, right? Like you don't want people getting HIV. You want the rates to go down. You want the incidence to go down. Um, as far as outbreak, um, outbreak is basically um, with respect to a community, a history. So there's always an expected amount of cases for certain diseases. And if there is a rapid increase in the expected amount of cases, then that's an outbreak. So what that means depends on the agent, depends on where you're talking about. If we had a measles case, that's an outbreak, like, because measles is super contagious and, and we have a vaccine for it and we keep track of it, so that would be considered an outbreak. But maybe if it was like uh, food poisoning, it would need to be like several people, like, to be considered an outbreak. So um, a lot of times they can determine outbreaks through uh, a syndromic evidence. So like I remember when I was in grad school, they talked about this pharmacist who noticed that like, he couldn't, he couldn't keep Imodium on the shelf, like the anti-diarrheal medicine. He's like, what's going on? Like everyone's pooping. So he called the health department and was like, uh, I think there's like some kind of diarrheal illness going around. And then they ended up linking it to contaminated drinking water, like in the city. And so that's how they figured out that there was an outbreak happening because they saw that increase in the signs and symptoms that were related to this thing. Um, so as I mentioned, it really depends on the agent. Um, if it's something that you are closely monitoring, maybe one case is considered an outbreak, or if there's a change, or if it's coming somewhere that isn't normally found. Um, and that's what happened like with Ebola back in 2014. Normally Ebola was in like, um, like the Congo, so like more remote part of Africa. And then it emerged in West Africa, which was more concerning because West Africa is highly populated. And so like one of the biggest cities in West Africa, um, which is uh, Lagos, uh, Nigeria, was one that was affected by Ebola. And so um, that was a problem, like that's why it was seen quickly, well not as quickly as it should have been, but it was seen as an outbreak, okay. Um, so as I said, like diseases have like a natural history. So some diseases are always kind of happening and that's called endemic. And so like in, on the continent of Africa, um, malaria is endemic. Like, and they actually call it hyperendemic because you see a lot of cases of malaria just all the time. Like it's just native to that area. But occasionally you will see spikes, maybe certain times a year where you weren't expecting it, or let's say there's a change in weather pattern and the mosquitoes are like more prevalent than they usually are. When you see that spike in cases over a relatively short period of time, whether that's like days, weeks, months, then that's called an epidemic. And epidemic, that term literally means on people. And so that was when we talked about the zoonotic life cycle, which most of you I felt like understood that. The epidemic part of um, vector-borne diseases was primarily the human-to-human -human transmission via the vector. Um, and then pandemic means all people. And so they consider it a pandemic when it spreads beyond the initial area and goes to multiple continents. So obviously coronavirus is a pandemic now. It started off as an epidemic, but because of the way it spread and globalization of travel, it quickly turned into a pandemic. All right, so um, epidemiology is basically a scientific discipline that's driven on data, and a lot of it is surveillance. I kind of underline surveillance, because a lot of it's just being nosy, like what's happening here, what's happening there? 
let's keep track of it, let's report this, and then let's analyze that data and determine a causal relationship. So we can't say for sure that like smoking cigarettes causes cancer, but we're pretty sure it causes cancer, right? Like because we have tons of evidence that supports that. And so a lot of epidemiology is having a hypothesis of some sort. And if you remember with basic scientific method, a hypothesis is like, is there an effect or not? And you can't say that something causes something, but you can say, did it affect this thing or did it not? Did something happen or did it not happen? Um, and the null hypothesis said that nothing happened. So you're trying to disprove that, right? You're trying to say something happened. And so you're trying to link these things um, to a, a disease, these risk factors. Um, and then your goal is to take that information and then apply it to the science of public health, which is actually educating communities about health-related conditions. So um, there are like federal and state levels to this and local levels. So I used Arizona as my example. Um, so like I lived in Pima County which was in southern Arizona, and that's where Tucson, which is the main big city there is. So we had the Pima County Health Department, but then we had the Arizona Department of Health Services. Um, and then they would, it kind of goes up the chain, and then the CDC would be above that, um, which is Centers for Disease Control. Then you have FDA, which is Food and Drug Administration, and they're the ones that regulate drug trials and certain processed foods. Then you have USDA, which is US Department of Agriculture, and that's gonna be like, food food, like fruits, vegetables, and meats, uh, meat animals. Um, National Institutes of Health, uh, which I believe is what Dr. Fauci is associated with, like as director, um, does research, so biomedical research. Um, and then World Health Organization is kind of like the world CDC, which by the way, it's totally ridiculous that Trump's trying to pull out of the World Health Organization, but that's another story, um, because they do a lot for developing countries and like maintaining um, health and, and best practices um, there. It's weird for us to even think that we're isolated. Like, the, like to pull out of something like that doesn't make sense because global health is American health. Like you, you can't like just put yourself in a little box and say you're never gonna come into contact with someone else. Um, so as far as the epidemiological studies, um, really this is a very simplified model uh, of how you determine what's causing a disease. And so you can examine the host factors and the pathogen factors and the environment. So all of these things play a role in whether or not you get a disease, right? So for example, if you think about malaria, what has to happen for you to get the disease malaria? You have to come in contact with an infected mosquito, right? So you need the pathogen, like you can't just get malaria from someone else. You have to come into contact with the infected mosquito. And how would you come into contact with the mosquito? Being, like in a location where the mosquito lives. Being in a location where the mosquito lives, that happens to carry that, right? So there's environmental factors. And then within that environment, there's gonna be factors, right? Like maybe if you live in an area that has really good housing and you have AC, and then you're able to keep mosquitoes out of your house versus you live somewhere where you're like having to catch water and you have mosquito breeding grounds, maybe you don't have as good uh, structure to your house and so mosquitoes are more likely to get inside of your house and, and bite you. So there's all these factors and then there's host factors too, right? Like some people are gonna be more prone to malaria than others. Like little kids, immunocompromised people are gonna be more prone to getting malaria. And so these aren't necessarily, it doesn't mean you will get it. We can't say definitively like, oh, just because you're giving them compromise, you're gonna get malaria. But we can just say that it's a risk factor, and a risk factor is something that increases the likelihood of you getting a disease. But it's, all, it's often multifactorial. I think that's what this simple model is trying to show. All right, so public health is a science of protecting and improving health in communities through education and promotion of healthy lifestyle. So there's all kinds of um, campaigns, I guess, that. Uh, CDC and state and local health departments use. And really, it's about health equity, so that people have um, you know, consistent access to the same level of health care, regardless of 
their social or economic standing. Um, so there's been all kinds of public health initiatives. Um, tobacco cessation's been a big one. Um, safe, I don't know what I meant by infections. That might be a typo. Is there a safe infection? Um, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what I meant by that. Polio eradication. Um, hand hygiene is a big one. Like actually, um, in the lab, we have a little hand washing poster that we just stole from some other health department. Like that's their little infographic that they use. Um, and so a lot of it is really just making people aware, um, making them aware of what health issues they might face based off of their personal experience. Um, and, you know, knowledge is power. Like having that information means that you can make more informed decisions. Um, and that is, this is highly driven by the data that's collected from the epidemiology side. So they pretty much are working like hand in hand. Um, like a lot of friends of mine that are epidemiologists, like they do a lot of the statistical analysis um, that gives you those associations. Okay, so I said a lot of it was surveillance. So surveillance is just collecting data basically. And you can do it actively where you set up an experiment where you are purposely going after that information. But most of our surveillance is actually passive and that's the reportable or notifiable diseases. And so the goal is that you collect this data, you analyze it, you interpret it, and then you will have some kind of action from that. So we want public health policy and change if necessary. Like, it, you know, we don't want to do things just because they've always been done that way. You want to do things that are based on data um, that's supported by science. Okay, so these diseases that you are um, obligated legally to report up your chain of command, whatever that happens to be where you're working, are called reportable or notifiable. So these are things that are of particular interest to public health because maybe they're really contagious, maybe they're not native to the US and so we would be worried if they started coming into our country. Um, and this information is giving us the statistics we need to determine uh, how we can control these things and then um, identify when there's future outbreaks. So we need that prevalence and incidence data and the passive reporting of these diseases is what gives us that. So there's a whole list of reportable diseases in that link there if you're interested in that. But a lot of it is stuff that like we have vaccines for, like so measles or polio or whooping cough would be reportable. West Nile virus is reportable. Things that are like unusual um, or that are super contagious often are things that are reportable. Um, as far as like sexually transmitted infections, I know that those are also reportable, but there is like a I think often the health department helps with contact tracing or your provider does like so it's like one of those sort of privacy issues, right? Like you don't want to necessarily violate someone's privacy, but people that are exposed need to know. And so they have ways of like letting people know like, hey, you've been exposed to yada yada. Like that's part of it as well. Um, so in here we talk more about infectious disease epidemiology, which is where you often know what the cause is. The cause is a pathogen. Now this actually wasn't really known <laughs> until like, the early 1900s, like, and then they start having like these awesome posters, like this picture of this dude sneezing, they're like, yo, cover your mouth. Um, and so that was something that we take for granted now. Like, we're like, oh, of course you do that. It's like, we didn't know, but they didn't know that. They didn't know that that's how diseases were spread. And so it's a relatively new field, this infectious disease and just epidemiology in general. So there are some interesting uh, historical studies uh, that maybe you've heard of. Um, that were kind of the first epidemiological, epidemiological studies. And one of them was for cholera and this guy named John Snow. So John Snow was um, in London and I think it was like in the 1800s, there was an outbreak of cholera. And cholera causes extreme diarrhea. So people die from dehydration like really quick. And so he was the first person to really like map what was happening. Um, and so he went door to door and on a map in that area, he put like just a, an X, like where people had died. 
And he noticed this pattern that it was all like concentrated around this one pump on a street that was called Broad Street. So they call it the Broad Street Pump. And so he was like, hmm, like everyone's using this pump right here. And then it turned out that that pump was getting supplied like downstream of another city. So like wastewater was like getting into that water and people were drinking it. And that's how they were probably getting cholera. So they just like took the handle off the pump and was like, don't use this one. And then got their water from another source. And then that's how that outbreak, which was like killing hundreds of people, like was stopped, which sounds like simple now, but that was like a huge deal. Like they didn't think to do that. And then that led to this whole uh, area of epidemiology that's called GIS, which is geographical information systems, where now they can do that. Like that's part of contact tracing is to see physically where something has moved through a population to kind of track it. Um, so this is something that now we just do routinely. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of an emerging infectious disease <laughs> right now, which is the coronavirus. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, coronavirus is not new. Like there's coronaviruses all around, but there are some strains that are more virulent than others. So back in 2008, it was the SARS coronavirus, uh, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus number one. And now we got round two which is causing the disease COVID, which is uh, COVID-19, because that's when it was discovered. Um, and so these are diseases that have increased recently in incidence. Um, coronavirus, a lot of the viruses seem to do these like weird 10 year cycles. I don't know what that's about. I feel like it's related to just how fast they mutate um, because viruses are always kind of mutating a little bit. But a lot of infectious diseases that are emerging are actually zoonotic or vector-borne. Um, and so those are things, zoonotic are spread from animals, and then vector-borne are obviously spread from vectors. Um, and so when you see these uh, rare diseases becoming more common, a mild disease becoming more severe, which is kind of what happened with COVID, local diseases becoming widespread or different signs and symptoms, those can be signs that you're dealing with an emerging infectious disease. Um, and there's a lot of complicated reasons why these pop up. Some of it's mutations in the pathogen itself, changes in human behavior, changes in geography, changes in climate. These are all things that can contribute to um, the distribution of diseases and failures in public health measures, which I think we're kind of seeing evidence of that right now to varying degrees. Um, so this is just some recent discoveries. It doesn't have the newest coronavirus on here, but um, you can see that uh, there have been uh, different pathogens that have been discovered, like um, Lyme disease was discovered in the 80s as being caused by this bacterium. HIV was a brand new, totally brand new virus, had not come from anything else. Um, let's see, uh, oh, the bird flu, um, which is the H5N1, that's actually been around for a little while. And it's particularly virulent in humans, but luckily it's not transmitted human to human. And then as I mentioned before, SARS, um, SARS coronavirus number one was the one that was discovered and we actually had a little out, like an, an epidemic from it. Um, actually, I think it did go pandemic because it came from like overseas and went to Canada, um, but it didn't become as big of a thing as this coronavirus. And I think for a couple different reasons, I think that it wasn't as contagious but also it literally wasn't as virulent. Like that strain just didn't cause as much mortality. So I think the overall mortality ended up being like 2% or something like that. Um, but even adjusting for age, this coronavirus has a higher mortality. It's still low relatively, but it's a little bit higher than the original coronavirus was. All right, so as far as uh, infectious disease epidemiology, the biggest risk factor is that you're near a case. Um, but then other things have to be met, right? So if we use coronavirus for an example, what they would denote as an exposure, which would be a relevant contact, would be very, being near someone unprotected for 15 minutes or longer. So even if, I'm not even gonna put bad juju out there. I'm just gonna say coronavirus was near us. I'm not gonna say anyone has it. Um, certain conditions would have to be met, right? Like we would have to be within a certain distance and we'd have to be uncovered, and then time is also a factor. Um, the distance matters, 
I guess somewhat because initially they were pretty sure it was like droplet transmission, but now there is evidence that it might be airborne. Um, but still proximity will matter because the virus isn't gonna travel forever necessarily. And so by maintaining distance, that's what gives you like a little buffer. Um, so anyway, a case is a risk factor, right? I, I think that makes sense. A case is someone who has it, they are a risk factor for you getting it, okay? Like that's just common sense. All right, so then how can it be transmitted? What, what, is, what, is the, what are these arrows? What does that mean? Like how is it going? So transmission is how you pass it from one to another and it's either direct or indirect. So indirect contact transmission means that there is something in between you and the other person. So for an airborne disease, the air is actually making it indirect because there's something in between us versus direct um, would be like sexually transmitted, vertically transmitted from mother to child, droplet transmission where I have to be fairly close to someone in order to get their illness. Any exchange of bodily fluids is gonna be considered direct. Um, and so those are the two main ways that infectious diseases are transmitted. It's either direct or indirect, but notice that it says contact. You have to have contact with someone that has it, that was either exposed. Um, you have to be exposed to someone that has it, but that could be direct or indirect. So sometimes people get confused. They're like, they think vector-borne diseases are not communicable, but I'm like, they are. You just didn't have contact with the person that the vector got it from. It's indirect transmission. Question. So, okay, so my stepmother had got coronavirus and my dad, of course, quarantined with her. Uh -huh. She tested positive twice, but he tested negative both times that he's with. You said this is who? My, my stepmom and my dad. She's tested positive twice when? She got sick a couple weeks ago and she tested positive. And my dad, of course, quarantined with her, but like he he hasn't tested positive. He's had no symptoms, no nothing, and he's been in the same household with her the whole time. They haven't spaced each other out? Like they haven't quarantined in the house? Like he's taking care of her? Um, so there's probably a, a lot of explanations for that that I don't know. Um, so she could test positive, but not be that infectious. Like she might not be shedding a lot of virus. Although usually if you test positive, you probably have a decent viral load for you to test positive. Um, how symptomatic is she? Uh, she had fevers in the beginning and like she felt like crap for days. Does she have a cough, much of a cough? So, I mean, honestly, she was probably most infectious the day of onset of symptoms, like fever. And then even if she's testing positive, I don't know how infectious she is, I guess, is the short answer. I mean, I was just curious because like, my dad's been there now for, for three weeks with her so far. Right, and he could have subclinical infection where he could be, I don't think he's preclinical because I feel like if he's going to be sick by now, he would be sick. Right. Um, he could just have an awesome immune system. Like I've heard of friends who, they were caretakers for people in their house and they didn't get it. Yeah. And that happens all the time anyway. Like, but to me, the thing that's a little bit concerning is like, you don't know. <laughs> like right. if you're going to be awesomely lucky like your dad or in your, it sounds like your stepmom didn't get super sick, she's doing okay. You don't know, like, because it's a novel disease, so that's the... Her symptoms went away after about a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's and that's she, pretty typical. So that's, she still tested positive again yeah. the second time. Yeah, so is she going to test again? Yeah, she has to test again in a week. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't maybe, go over there, so I don't, I don't really keep up with it. Yeah, yeah it sounds like she just has a high viral load. But weirdly, she's, she's not had, sick anymore because her immune system took care of it. Right, she's also had a, she had bypass surgery. Yeah, so I mean, she could. I think you can still have a higher viral load, but you are still in the convalescent phase where you're getting over it, which is kind of unusual. So I don't really know all the dynamics of that. It's really hard to say. Um, but I would say maybe she either isn't that infectious or your dad just has a good immune system or some combination of both of those things. Um, well, and then I would ask, I guess, what test, what kind of test did she do? Like rapid test or PCR? They did rapid test. 
Yeah, for a rapid test to still be positive too, I mean, she must have a high viral load. That's all I can think of. I mean, I don't know because our facility had the rapid test and we have the facility of 40, 20 had false positives. So I just, the rapid tests aren't, or the ones that they did have weren't that good. I think they came out with a better one, but. Yeah, like at the beginning, you mean? Like Like two weeks ago, we had (laughs) them, but. (laughs) Yeah. But this was a little nursing home in Harris, so I don't, you know what I mean? I don't know where they got theirs. I mean, rapid tests are nice because they're rapid, but it doesn't help if they're not accurate because, I mean, it's, both directions are bad. Like, a false positive gives unnecessary anxiety to the person, but also it means they might have to, like, friggin' quarantine for, like, 14 days or 10 days or whatever, which is inconvenient, but... I'm like, I would actually be okay with that. Like, as long as someone could watch the kids. I mean, well, <laughs> whenever you've got 20 employees in a facility of, like, elderly and sick yeah. people, like, you need those people to take care of those right, people. Right. So yeah. You can't really just have yeah. the other people live there. Right. Because yeah. you're worried about killing grandma. Like, if yeah. you have a positive <laughs> test, then it's like, what can you do? I guess you could retest. But, yeah. and I've heard some health facilities, too, are like, like, technically, the rule is that if you would get exposed to someone, you are supposed to isolate. Like, you're, like even if you test negative, like, that's, like, the rule. But the thing is that healthcare facilities, like you said, you need someone to take care of someone. So if someone tests negative and they're, like, without fever or whatever, like, I think most facilities are letting them, like, go back to work, which I think, I actually think is okay, but um, I don't know. I think that's pretty common. I think it's pretty common, unfortunately. I mean, because there's so many unknowns, like the accuracy of the test and who tests positive when and, like, was it really an exposure? And that's why, like, you know, when students email me, and I'm not an epidemiologist, so, I mean, I don't I don't have all the answers, but, you know, sometimes when they email, I have to, I just ask follow-up questions to kind of, like, help assess what their risk actually is. Like, do we need to tell people around? Like I've had, like in one of my classes, I had someone that tested positive, but she wasn't, but she was smart and she didn't come sick. So like we didn't really need to tell everyone like in the room because that's gonna make unnecessary panic. Maybe the girl next to her, who never ended up being sick, like ne- you know. And I, so I just let the proper person know, our security person. I told him, and I sent a snapshot of my seating chart, and I was like, I think maybe this one and this one were exposed, but really were they exposed? Because we had a mask on, and it's not like they were like all up in each other's personal space. So yeah, there's just a lot of unknowns. More like mine, because I had to quarantine with my kids. Yeah, right. Yeah, because you're their caretaker. So yeah, there's so many like logistical, you know, issues associated with it too. So I mean, we're gonna make mistakes, you know? Like I'm not saying that I know what to do, but um, we could probably do better, (laughs) like in general, I guess, I don't know. It's hard to say if this is going to go away, but... All right, um, so as I said, you can get things either directly or indirectly. Um, So you have to have an exposure, which is what we were all just talking about, is a relevant contact. So yes, I would be be nervous if one of you guys came up with coronavirus, and I'd be nervous for you. But I don't know, I would have to like, you know, you got to talk yourself down a little bit. I don't know how worried I would be. Like maybe in lab, if I was like, oh man, I helped that person for like... 15 minutes, which I wouldn't even do, right? Like, you have to think about what the risk factor is. Like, the odds of us being close to each other for 15 minutes or longer, plus we have masks on, is like, the risk is not zero, but it's like, it becomes sort of negligible, you know? So exposure means a relevant contact, and that depends on the agent, because the agent is is transmitted the way it's transmitted. And so you block that route of transmission, then you're gonna block exposure, potentially. so direct is where you have a close, intimate contact with someone that has that pathogen. So that would be skin to skin, mucous membranes, across the placenta, breast milk, and a sneeze cough, which is like droplets. And then indirect is where there is some, something in between you guys. So you didn't, uh, you drank the same water, or you ate the same food, or you breathed the same air, or a mosquito bit you and then bit someone else, but you didn't get it from that person per se directly, but it was transmitted from a common source, and that's what we mean by indirect. So indirect diseases are communicable. Like malaria is communicable indirectly. 
versus chlamydia is directly communicable. So that's how it's transmitted. All right, so as far as like the, the contact tracing, this is a, a simple version of it. Um, the index case is the first patient, and they call it in the movies like patient zero, which to me has like a negative connotation somehow. Like now we've like hyped it up like, uh, you did it, you brought it to everyone. <laughs> and I don't know who patient zero is for coronavirus, and I don't know that it would matter like, necessarily, because now it's just like kind of all over the place. I don't even think they ever found out. Yeah, I mean, I think with the Ebola outbreak, I remember very succinctly, it was a little baby, it was a little two-year-old that was the index case that passed away. Um, and they just figured it out from geography. Like they, they saw it spread from this village out into the cities as like, okay, the caretaker, like someone got scared and ran away and they jumped the border and then now they went somewhere and it kind of just got out of control. Um, but what I really want to point out about this is, is a couple things. So in order for you to have a, get a disease, you have to be susceptible. So susceptible means that you're not immune. And if you are immune, you can't get the disease. So notice how people that are immune have a little like protection, like they, they don't transmit to anyone else. So if you're immune, you don't get infected. That's what immune means. And if you're not infected, then you're not gonna transmit it to someone else, which is why vaccines are so critically important because they make the population immune and not susceptible, but it also has this effect of protecting people that are susceptible. Because you put a little barrier of immunity around them, and then people that are susceptible are protected. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting, yeah, question to me. Uh, someone got the coronavirus once now. Yes, I heard that, and I don't know how common that is, and I don't know if we'll find that out. Um, and I think he had different manifestations each time, too. Yeah, he said it's the second time it was way worse which is weird, <laughs> I'm like, great. So it's almost like he had a hypersensitivity, but I don't, I don't think we have enough data yet. Just, I'm sure maybe you could, I mean, you can get the common cold more than once, but the common cold is caused by 100 different plus viruses. So anyone, so anyone who is not, he must have not been immune then. And I'll, actually there's a diagram that will kind of speak to that, where you're talking about him getting it more than once. Okay, other terms, subclinical means you don't have signs or symptoms. But can you transmit? Yes. Okay, like a lot of diseases, the incubation period, you are subclinical. You don't have signs or symptoms yet, but a subclinical person can transmit to someone else. And can a clinical person? Heck yes. Okay, like you're probably the most contagious or infectious with coronavirus the first day you have symptoms. Um, like the first day you have a fever or the cough or whatever. Now some diseases you are infectious before that. Like at, at, it depends on the disease. Like so, and then some of them it's later. Like Ebola, you actually aren't very infectious until you're like super sick. And that's why it's, its spread was very much linked to caretakers because the people that were most likely to get it were the people that were taking care of you when you were the sickest, and that's when you were the most infectious. Okay, um, so to summarize what, what we were saying about this, if you have a susceptible population, disease will spread. If there are people in the population that are immune, they can't get sick, and so they can't transmit it to others. People that are subclinical can still transmit disease. And people that are clinical can transmit disease, which I think most people know. Clinical means signs and symptoms are apparent. Subclinical means signs and symptoms are not apparent. And then with this outbreak, this other term called preclinical has come up. And preclinical is kind of weird because it puts you in two places in the same, at the same time. Preclinical are those people that are destined to get sick. And I know that sounds weird, but when we talk about our exposure to someone, like how risky it was, we are more at risk for someone who was preclinical than someone that was subclinical. Because a preclinical person ended up getting sick. Does that, does that make sense? Isn't it weird? It's like time, space, like it's kind of weird. So it's kind of hard to wrap your head around this preclinical thing. But we don't know who's preclinical, right? Like we can't tell the future. We can only say retrospectively, yep, that person got sick, but this other person didn't, so I would be more at risk exposed to the person who actually got sick 
than the person who was not sick, which would be a subclinical person. All right, uh, another thing that has to happen for you to get a pathogen is that you have to have conditions met for this chain of infection. And so I think uh, uh, I actually, uh, I think I still need to make the practice quiz for you guys, which I'll do today. And I'll make sure you have enough time to do it. Um, but one of the questions I always ask, and I ask this on the exam, is I give you the chain of infection, and I'm like, tell me about two of the links and how you could break them. Because if you break any link in the chain, it falls apart. If you remove a link from the chain, infection cannot occur. So these are the things that have to be present. You have to have a pathogen. You have to have a reservoir, which is a source of infection. It's a source of the pathogen. You have to have a means of escape. You have to be able to get out of that reservoir and then be transmitted. Uh, so you have to have a mode of transmission. If it's not transmissible, then that's not, it's not going to go anywhere. And a means of entry. So it has to have a way to get in. And then host susceptibility. So if you had to guess, what's the easiest thing that we can manipulate? How can we manipulate means of entry? Well, for like corona, means of escape and means of entry would be your mask. Yeah, right? Good. And then what else have we done historically? Vaccines. Vaccines, which is host susceptibility. Okay, it is sort of other things too. Like sometimes people get confused because they're like, is being vaccinated like a means of entry? Like not really because they can still get in, but the host is not susceptible when they're vaccinated appropriately and they show an immune response. Um, the single most important thing you can do is wash your hands. Uh, washing your hands probably breaks a lot of these things. Like, what would you say washing your hands could deal with? Mode of yeah, mode of transmission, right? It's probably the, the best one. Um, and then click, what was that? Yeah, or a means of escape because they can't go from you to someone else. Um, disinfecting your environment, I guess, kind of gets rid of any reservoirs of infection. Or like if it's a zoonotic disease, if you vaccinate your animals, like we talked about rabies, vaccinating your pups and your cats, like it removes that source of infection in the population. So I think a lot of this is common sense. Like people see a diagram like this, I'm like, oh my God, there's stuff happening on it. But I'm like, you guys understand this. Like, you exist in the world. Like, and I think if you really thought about it, all of you could come up with some reasonable things. Like, what could I do to prevent this from happening? And it's probably helpful if you use a specific example. Like, think of a disease that you're familiar with or something like coronavirus, if you want, and then use it to kind of think, okay, what could I do to remove these links? And remember, if any of the links are removed, then infection won't occur. All right, so breaking the chain of infection, the biggest way that we can do it, as I already told you guys, is hand washing and then vaccination so that we can get herd immunity. And like over this outbreak, like uh, I've been thinking to myself, like I don't think herd immunity means what you think it means. Like, you know, when you hear like politicians talking about it and I'm like, dude, we need more nurses, we need more doctors, we need more scientists in politics because these people don't know what they're talking about. Sorry to get on my soapbox. You guys know more than them. Like it's frustrating that they're in positions of power when I'm like, dude, my students could like tell you guys what's what, you know? Like it, to me, it's very frustrating that they don't, they rely on scientists that fit their agenda, which I, I just disagree with. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll get off that soapbox. So um, herd immunity is this idea that if most people are immune, then disease won't spread. Um, so you need a sufficiently high proportion of people that are immune for it to not spread. And so like freaking Rand Paul was like trying to argue with Dr. Fauci about like there being herd immunity. I'm like, we don't have herd immunity, dude. Like <laughs> clearly we don't because of the number of cases that are coming up. And he was trying to say that herd immunity like 60%. I was like, nah, bro. It's like, it needs to be like 80, 90% because it's a contagious disease. The higher contagiousness, the higher the people, a number of people that have to be vaccinated for you to get herd immunity. And so, you're sorry. You're probably thinking that people that have gotten it already are, have already built an immunity to it. And Which we don't know happens. if they have. Right. And some people have gotten it and they have no antibodies after. Um, a friend of mine got coronavirus kind of mildly. Her kids got it and then she got it. And she did have convalescent antibodies. 
But we don't know if those antibodies are protective. We actually don't know that yet. Like a lot of these experimental treatments with the convalescent antibodies, they might help, but it's still passive immunity because you're getting someone else's antibodies, which is never gonna be as good as making your own. So yeah, he's, he might be counting on that, and I say we cannot count on that yet. Like, we don't know. So um, anyway, uh, herd immunity, most people vaccinated, disease won't spread. So vaccination and hand washing, and then we talked about a few of the other ways, like disinfecting your space, wearing your mask, social distancing or physical distancing, those are helpful too. All right, so I, I mean, I, again, I try not to have too strong of opinions, um, but when it comes to certain public health things, uh, and as a scientist, I hope you guys can open your mind to the fact that vaccines are necessary. It's a calculated risk, it's a risk assessment. They're not without side effects. Anytime you introduce a foreign thing into your body, there's a chance that your body won't like it, that your immune system will be like, ah, what is this? Or you'll have an allergic reaction or something. But we have to look at that risk-benefit, risk okay? Uh, and vaccines are generally safe, so the risk is worth it, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. So why does this matter? How do we get herd immunity? Well, why are we struggling to get it right now? Because we don't have a vaccine. And we have uneven immunity, like with coronavirus. Like, we don't know who's immune. We don't know if those are good antibodies. And antibodies are only one aspect of the immune response. We would love to get T cell activation. And they have shown, I think, experimentally that T cells do get involved. But we don't know for sure the way the immune system responds yet. And so it's going to be a while before we even get herd immunity, actually. Like, if we get it at all, if we ever get it. So if we had a vaccine, then that would be great because we could induce herd immunity artificially. Um, so let's say that you're, this is the situation that we're in right now, basically, that everyone technically is susceptible. Now, there might be people who genetically have a great immune system. Some people just become colonized with it, but it doesn't really do anything. But overall, we're all susceptible, technically, okay? Because we don't have a vaccine and it's a new virus, so our immune system might not recognize it. And so the scenario is that everyone <laughs> might get sick, right? Which is what we're seeing now. Like we're all susceptible, so a lot of people get sick. That's the top scenario. Um, in the bottom here, some of the people get immunized, and those are the people in yellow. And if some of the people get immunized, then you still get a lot of people that get sick. But the one thing to notice is that you create sort of um, like protective barriers by people. So like this person here might remain healthy because they have two immune people around them and that lessens their chance of getting sick. Because not everyone can be vaccinated. Like babies can't get most vaccines until they're like two months old. Like, and then they have like a two, four, six series. And then, they, so they have gaps in their little immune systems. People that have cancers, certain viruses, like they, they're just not able to get vaccines. And so your choice does matter because you're, it's not just about you, it's like protecting the people around you, like in your, in your community. So then if most people get vaccinated, then you're really protecting these people that can't get vaccinated because you are forming a wall of protection. Here's a sick person, here's a healthy person. If you vaccinate most of the people, that person has a chance of staying healthy. And so to me, that's like, the biggest, I feel like that's a personal responsibility like that people have to take is that I care enough about other people that I'm not gonna knowingly expose them to stuff, okay? All right, so um, when we were talking about uh, Cindy's dad, like not inexplicably not getting coronavirus, it seemed, there's probably a lot of genetic components to that and there's probably like exposure, like. You know, it's not like your mom, your stepmom was just like that in his face like all the time, right? Like I'm sure he was still kind of like, all right, like, I love you, but I'm gonna love you like sort of far away-ish. So he probably wasn't getting exposed constantly to her maybe, although he did have the biggest risk because he's in the house with her. Um, he probably has an immune system, like everyone's immune system is special and unique. It'd be really interesting to get to see his antibodies, like to see, like maybe he'll do an antibody test later and just see, like did he make antibodies and then maybe your stepmom didn't, and that's why she's still positive, like with her. Uh, 
Yeah, that'd be really interesting to know. And then let us know that it doesn't violate HIPAA somehow, I guess. Um, which we might be violating HIPAA. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, as long as you don't know his personal information. Yes, exactly. So we're good. Against HIPAA. I might send you data. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So your dad is subclinical, right? Like he's positive, but he's different. Or he, he's not positive. He's negative. Oh, so he's no infection. Yeah, he's negative on both on both of his tests, and my second okay. is positive on both of her tests. And then she's, but she's not having symptoms anymore. Not anymore, no. Okay, so she went from uh, she was sick for a week and a half. Okay, so now we don't know what her. We actually don't know where she is, I guess, right? Because she was clinical. And now she's not, but you can become a carrier, I guess. But I don't know if they know that coronavirus can do that. Like if people can be carriers after they get it, which might explain why her test is still positive, but I don't really know. And then she could be immune, but I don't know that either because it seems like she's still having a positive test. I don't, I don't know. Or she could not be immune, <laughs> like which is maybe more likely given her immunosuppression because of her heart situation. So we don't really know, but those are the outcomes of clinical. And then luckily, you know, your mom's all right. Like she didn't, she didn't get super sick. Sure. So that's always a possibility, and that's why vaccines are important because, like, uh, you could die. Like, <laughs> so if you want to take a risk, like, and a lot of viruses don't have treatments. Like they, there's, it's easier to prevent them than it is to treat them. Well, the reason why most people were dying was because it was dropping their oxygen levels. And they were literally having chest pains because they couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. Well, and I actually read a fascinating article, which I didn't totally understand all of it, to be honest, because it had a lot of respiratory physiology in it. And I was like, huh, lungs, yeah. And uh, it was talking about how people's oxygen levels, like their hypoxia was so bad, and they were reporting that they were fine. There's some weird feedback between <laughs> the nerves. I don't know if it's protection, your body's like, well, it's getting all sparkly. This might be the end. Uh, let's just chill out. Like, I don't know if it's something your mind does to like protect you. You're just like in la la land. But it was like the weird. I'll have to see if I can find it because I think I emailed it to myself. I was just like, when I was blown away. When levels drop, it's almost like they hallucinate. Right, like euphoria. Like, but, but they were not showing physical signs of poor breathing. Like they weren't using accessory muscles or anything. Like they were literally just like. But their oxygen was like not compatible with life. Like so the doctors were just like, oh my God. and they were putting them on oxygen and they were being better. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, but they weren't acting sick. Like, so it's just bizarre. It's just so bizarre. Like I don't want any part of it. But uh, yeah, I'm like I don't want it. Okay. So anyway, you get exposed to an agent, right? You could get no infection, like your dad. Like hooray! But if you're not infected, then we don't know if you're immune. Like we don't really know what that situation is. If you're clinical, you could die, you could carry her, you could get immune, or you could get not immune. Boo! So then not only did you go through it, but being not immune means you could get it again, like that one dude who got it again. Now, if you're subclinical, it means that you never showed apparent signs or symptoms. And some people test positive, but never manifest signs and symptoms. So they can become a carrier, and they can become immune, actually, which is kind of nice. But they can also not be immune. Like, oh, so I don't know what that means. I don't know if they would get it again or what. And then some people just become a carrier. And I don't know, I don't know the situation about coronavirus. I don't know if we know that yet. Like, how many people are carriers? Because we don't have accurate enough tests. Like, we can't necessarily differentiate between just virus hanging out and virus that's like actively causing an infection, like doing stuff. So we can't really say. But this is typically what happens. And notice that it all goes back to exposure. For any of these things, uh, exposure would even put you at risk in the first place. All right, this is another diagram that you will be asked about. Um, I always put this on the exam, and I ask you to answer some questions about it. So this is called the stages of disease or the stages of illness. And this is what they typically go through as far as the severity of signs and symptoms which is on the y-axis, or the number of microbes in your body. So in general, if you just had to make a correlation, how do you think the number of microbes correlates to your signs and symptoms? Yeah, the more you are, the, the more you have, the worse you are. Now, it's kind of interesting. In your case, we don't know your mom's like viral load. 
She's testing positive, so the virus is still hanging around. She works in a gas station. Oh yeah, so she, I mean, she could be re exposed, but that seems like it'd be bad luck even for her. Yeah. But none of the other employees tested positive. It was just her. Yeah, and it could be her immune system too. Um, so yes, it, so the more microbes, the more signs and symptoms, typically. Okay. So it goes through this like progression, basically. So the first stage is called incubation period, and that's where you have no signs or symptoms. So I think for coronavirus, it's like, what, like three to five days or something like that, incubation period. It's really similar to like, like actually, I think it's a little bit longer than a cold, but it's in that range of like cold flu where it's like three to five days. And then the best time to get tested is like, yeah, like, after exposure, like seven days after exposure, like within that seven days or whatever. So incubation, you have no signs and symptoms. Why? Because your microbe load is pretty low at that point. Like your viral load, if it's a virus, would be low. And then I, I don't know how coronavirus prevents, but I've heard that people have mentioned a prodromal period where you have this vague sense of unease, like <laughs> where you're like, uh, I think I'm getting sick. Uh, and then next day you're like, oh, I'm sick, like really sick. But some people just went from zero to 60. Like they were like, okay, and then they were like needing oxygen, like hospitalized. And that was probably older people. Like it, it probably wasn't young people as frequently. But for dromal period is where you have that vague sense of unease, where you start popping vitamin C like crazy, hoping that you can stave it off. And not all diseases have a dromal period. Okay, so some diseases do, some don't. Okay, the next one then is illness. So what do you suppose is happening then? You're sick. You're sick, right? That's when you feel the most signs and symptoms. So that's when they would be the most severe. And that's where a test is probably most likely to be positive, I would guess. That's when you're most likely to transmit it to someone else. That's when you're most likely to have a complication of some sort where you might need oxygen or just some help. Um, and then what causes you to turn that corner? between illness and decline? Your immune system. Your immune system, right? Your immune system's like, oh, I figured it out. Like, this is what's happening. Or supportive care, right? Like, having proper treatment and, and the things you need to get better. So, declining signs and symptoms. The microbe load is going down thanks to the help of your immune system and whatever supportive treatment. And then convalescence is where you have no signs or symptoms. But notice that the microbe load is still there. And so your stepmother is in convalescence, it sounds like, but that doesn't mean that the microlobe is zero, and that's probably, too, why she's still having a positive test result. And if her immune system is a little bit weak, her load, her threshold might be higher. So, like, if a normal person is down there, then maybe, you know, your stepmom's is still kind of up a little bit. Right. But she doesn't have signs or symptoms, so clearly her immune system has a handle on it, but she still has the presence of the virus, I guess. So these are, if you um, then were to think about it, like the shape of this graph could change, right? And it could change on very specific factors. So like an older person with COVID, what's the illness phase gonna look like? Longer, right? Like it's literally gonna be like a longer period of time. And so sometimes I'll ask you questions. I think there's questions on the worksheets that come with this that ask you, like, imagine a disease where this happened or this happened or this happened. How would it change that, that curve? How would it change the disease progression? All right, this is related to infectiousness. When are you likely to transmit? So this is a little bit of an overlap with the previous diagram. And this one, it's important to pay attention to where these overlaps are between the top and the bottom uh, image. So first of all, um, just because you're exposed doesn't mean you're gonna be infected. Infected means that it's actually like kind of taken hold, but it's actually colonized your body uh, efficiently. So when you first get infected, you cannot transmit the disease yet. And that's called a latent period. So the latent period, like day you know, one, you can't give it to anyone else yet because the microbe load isn't high enough yet. And so that corresponds with the incubation period. Because the incubation period is a time where you don't have signs or symptoms yet. 
So at the beginning of that, you can't transmit yet. And that's called the latent period. Now, partway through the incubation period, you become infectious. So you can spread it when you are feeling okay still. If you, that's how I translate that. So towards the end of incubation, you become infectious, which means you can pass it to someone else. And then you hit the symptomatic period, and the symptomatic period, if you go back to the other image, that would be illness and decline, right? So during illness and decline, but especially during illness, at the beginning of illness, you are infectious. But can you spread it the whole time you're sick? I think we intuitively know you can't. And that could be the situation with your parents too. Like there was only a certain time that she was more likely to spread it, but she became non-infectious even while she was still sick. Okay, so you become non-infectious at the end of the disease symptoms. And then when you're in convalescence, which is non-disease, you are non-infectious. Okay, so it's the overlap that kind of tells a story there. And I always ask questions about this, because this is one of my favorite little diagrams. Okay, um, finally we have the reservoirs. And then I'm gonna introduce you to the chapter 15, which I think will make, make you understand your assignment, your extra credit a little bit better. So reservoirs are the sources of infection or pathogen in, a, in an environment. So it can be living, like a person or an animal, and animal infections for, to humans are called zoonotic, like zoo. Um, and then non-living, which would be soil or water, those are the most common. So if they get contaminated from humans, then you could come into contact with it. So what they saw um, with the original uh, coronavirus back in the day is that it jumped species at some point to, I don't know what a civet is, like uh, maybe some little primate thing. And then a bat, like at some point it mutated and it was able to jump hosts. And that's how humans were able to get um, SARS. Okay. All right, so that was chapter 14. And now I'm gonna actually jump to um, one little chart, which is this one here. So it's a couple, it's several pages down down the way, and then I'll go back to the other stuff next time. Oh, like a wildcat? Like a wildcat? They do what? The puppy do that poppy? Okay. I don't know anything about that. So it's a cat. Okay. It makes coffee. And coffee? It makes coffee? I think it eats. Yeah, like, is that what you're saying to me? Oh, it eats coffee beans. beans. <laughs> So they take the cat's poop. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I've heard of this before. I just didn't know that that would be animal. That type of cat is a civet cat. Oh, well, that would explain the coronavirus then. We're <laughs> <laughs> drinking too much coffee. Which is so, and I'm like, don't use an excuse to be a racist piece of crap. But anyway, like, people are crazy. Like, like you've never eaten anything weird. Okay. Anyway. And weird is relative, right? Yeah. It's all cultural. Weird is very relative. Right. Yeah. Okay, so when you guys do your extra credit thing, this is kind of what we will anchor it back to, is that the ability of a pathogen to be a pathogen is part of its genetic makeup. Like, it's, it's genetic traits that they have. So what you guys will notice in the database when you look it up is that a lot of times a gene is in italics, and that gene encodes for a protein that helps them cause disease. So virulence is how severe the disease is. And then pathogenicity is the ability to cause disease. But what's interesting uh, is that if you kind of, like you notice that salmonella had a lot of virulence factors, like there was a big old list, but if I went to another pathogen, there might not be as many. So sometimes it doesn't matter how many, it matters which ones are there. But some are fundamental to causing disease. Like I would probably guess that all bacterial pathogens have adherence factors because sticking to the host cell is the first necessary step for you to cause any kind of infection. So adherence means to bind to, to attach to. And then I give you an example, biofilms and flagella, which we'll talk more about those later. Resistance to or evasion of the host immune system is huge. 
Okay, so those are methods by which they circumvent your defense system. So they're getting around your defense system so that they can cause an issue. Example of that is capsule. Um, invasion allows them to penetrate deeper into tissues. And that's uh, collagenase and hyaluronidase, which break apart the, um, the sugars that are holding your cells together. Um, competition for nutrients is also one that's important. They like to steal your iron from you, and the proteins that they use to do that are called siderophores. And then finally, there's toxin production. And not all bacteria make toxins, but the ones that do happen to be more virulent because toxins are poisons. Okay? They interfere with your cells, which is going to fundamentally mess with your system. So this is what we'll link that little assignment back to is these here. And these, I should uh, also say, are bacterial virulence factors. Okay, other pathogens have other things. And I focus a little bit more on bacteria. All right, so we will start with our activity next time, just our discussion about what you guys find out. And then we'll finish chapter 15. And then remember, we moved the exam to Tuesday. So we'll have a review via Zoom next Monday, and then you'll have your exam on Tuesday. Okay. All right, guys. Um, I think we'll. I think the lab should be empty. So we'll start at like 11:15, so you can get started on your unknown stuff.